Game designers love Spelunky. It's a game that appears quite simple at first glance, but contains a rich depth that fans find satisfying to explore. It takes a commonplace genre, 2D platformers, and constructs an experience with multiple layers of player discovery and emergent gameplay. We explored these aspects of the game's design in the first video of our Rediscovering Mystery series, and seeing as this is the final video in that series, we thought we'd get the band back together. Derek Hugh, Andy Hull, and Eric Serke were responsible for bringing the modern version of Spelunky to life, but how they did it, and the road they travelled to get to this point is deserving of its own story. So in this deep dive, we're not only going to tell you how Spelunky came to be created, but we're also going to dive deep into how its various mechanics interact with one another, its weapons, enemies, areas, and more. But before all all that, well, you know the drill by now, right? It's time for an origin story. I grew up in Pasadena, that's in Southern California. Uh, I grew up with games. My mom apparently played a lot of Centipede when she was pregnant with me, and then when she got so big that she had a hard time walking, uh, my dad bought her an Atari 2600 and she played that at home. So you could say I was kind of a gamer from the womb. <laughs> Uh, but I did come out and yeah, played play the Atari 2600, I remember. And I spent a lot of time when I was a kid just designing games on, on paper. Uh, I just draw up the levels and the characters and things like that. My uncle uh, was the first one to get a Nintendo Entertainment System, so I'd go over to his house and play. He bought it for my cousins, they weren't that interested in it, but when I played it I was like, this is incredible, this is amazing, this is what I want to do. And so I just, as soon as I could start just like designing games, I did, basically. And so I tried a little bit of programming, but I didn't know where to start. I remember making some text adventures in BASIC and not really getting too far with those. And then one day, and I saw an ad for Click and Play in a magazine. And I remember the ad very clearly. It had a mouse, and coming out of the mouse were all kinds of crazy things. There was like a court jester and a, a uh, jet plane and a dragon, and at the bottom it said the, the revolutionary instant game creator. And I was like, Mom, please, you've got to get this for me. And being the, the supportive parent that she was, she got it, and that kind of changed everything for me. Have you ever played a computer game and thought, I could design a better game than that? Well, here's your chance to prove it with Click and Play. Click and Play is a revolutionary new concept in computer entertainment that taps into the imagination of its players by supplying them with all the parts and logic to create their own games. Click and Play requires no programming knowledge and comes complete with over 10 varieties. Click and Play, it's a lot like Game Maker and Unity. It's, a, it's an all-in-one package game making tool. It's very visually oriented, it has a built-in sprite editor and things like that and it just clicked with me no pun intended, immediately like this, all of a sudden game making made sense to me because I'm more of an artist by nature than a programmer. I actually enjoy doing some programming, but I mostly like doing the logic of the game itself. So programming, you know, how does this character gonna move and interact with this item and things like that. The game engine stuff I'm not as interested in. So click and play was great because it took all of that away. And there was some programming, but it was all the logic stuff that I liked. But everything was, was built into it. You could just draw a character in the program, you drag it onto the screen, you tell it what to do, you, you test it out, and then when you want to make a game, you just press make game, and there it is. It made game making and game development more like drawing for me, in the sense that I have an idea for a drawing, I can just put it to paper, right? It's kind of like I can, I can put the idea out about as fast as I can think of it. And so click and play just made that interface from my thoughts to the game very quick. So what type of games did you make? What were your like first games? So the very first game that I made was called Sasquatch Fight, I believe. It was a uh, one versus one death match where you each control a Sasquatch. It was a uh, side view in these like single screen arenas and you're just trying to knock the other Sasquatch into the water. There's something really sad about like two Sasquatches, which are like presumably quite endangered, if at all they exist, fighting each other. I know, it's true. It's like you should be mating or something, right? But after that, I made a game called Trigger Happy, which was also a deathmatch game, but it was top down. You control a little soldier, you're just trying to shoot the other person and collect items. And that one I actually released 
And I remember very distinctly uploading it onto some server or whatever on AOL. And right after I put that up, I started getting emails from people saying, hey, this is really cool. Do you have more? I really like you know, what you're doing here. Even though this is a very simple game, but getting that feedback from people, you know, you can imagine being a kid and spending all this time like doing these little sprites and click and play and then uploading it and then instantaneously people are playing the game and giving you feedback. It was just huge. So that really started me on my career and I think of that as kind of my first big game. The click and play community was growing. It supported an entire ecosystem of design. Designers were teaming up to make studios like online Trias clubs. Sites like the Daily Click would spread the news of the day, and the wall bulletin board was crammed full of designers posting their games for public consumption. An insular community playing each other's games, giving feedback, writing reviews, and finding inspiration for the next project. If the modern indie scene could be traced back, it would be to communities like this. And it was here that Derek ran into Andy. Uh, so my name's Andy Hall. Um, I'm a programmer uh, on Spelunky. Uh, so I started making games back in middle school, actually, um, with a program called Click and Play. So it was a really exciting time. And I just remember every summer, it was like everybody else was excited that they could like go swimming or like go on vacation. And I was like, I have three months of game development time. It's gonna be amazing. Do you remember each other's usernames? I do, yeah. I was just, Derek, I think. At the time, I didn't really have a handle. He was Astro Spoon. <laughs> okay. He had a, a game that he made called Astro Spoon. Okay. And it was a lot like Mega Man, except instead of robot masters, they were spoons. Like different types of spoons. I, and, uh, I can yeah. only name like three different types of spoons. Like ladle, right. well, teaspoon. I think they were pretty special spoons. It was basically Mega Man. I mean, it was it was a Mega Man knockoff, and you played as Astro Spoon, but there were like other spoons, like Twin Spoon and Ninja Spoon, and you went to their levels and you had to beat them. And you would get their weapons, and a lot of the sound effects were just straight up from Mega Man games. Like, I, I was not trying, you know, but I mean, I was learning, right? You're a kid, you're mashing stuff up, you're just like figuring out what works. Like, I, I get the compulsion to make a Mega Man clone, but why spoons? Um, that is a really good question that I still don't think I know the answer to because there's literally no spoons in the game. There's n nothing in the game was a spoon. There was there was nothing really, there's no reason to call it that. So, so what the, what I, I just thought it was funny as a kid, I think. What did Astro Spoon look like? Um, so he looked like Mega Man, okay. amazingly <laughs> enough, except he was wearing red. Oh! He had blue hair, he didn't have a helmet on. Okay. And he wore like kind of like goggles, like engineering goggles on his forehead. Right. And that's pretty much, that was pretty much his design. Cool. Yeah. All these young designers grew up. Click and Play was rebranded as Multimedia Fusion, and the games they created evolved from clones of existing titles to fully fledged games. Derek teamed up with a friend from his hometown, John Perry, to make a side scrolling platformer, Eternal Daughter. Development of this game dragged on for two years as both men graduated high school and went to their separate colleges. Derek finished the game while studying computer science at Berkeley. Yeah, so I started to feel really down at the time because I. I wasn't working with John anymore. After Eternal Daughter, you know, he kind of did his own thing at, at university. Um, and I didn't really have anyone to make games with. And I was just completely burnt out from, from school. And I was feeling very dim about my prospects being a game developer professionally. Yeah, I, like I wasn't doing good at school either. I mean, my grades weren't that, weren't that hot. And I was just getting sick because I was so stressed out and had no sleep. So it was, it was, very, it was a very uh, low point, I think, for me at the time. And I decided I wasn't gonna do games and I was actually gonna focus more on my art and maybe do comic books. Yeah, I was actually a wooden toy designer uh, for the first five years out of college. Uh, so I made wooden toys, uh, mostly for like three to five year olds. A lot of wooden food sets, so I did a sushi set. Uh, a grill set, I did a pirate chest, the mailbox, stuff like that. So it was really actually quite good because I was really burnt out on programming after college and it felt like, oh, I really could just get to do art stuff. Very relaxing a lot of times at work, um, just very creative work. 
Um, and also just like the iteration and making like a saleable product and just learning all about like packaging and graphic design especially. The art director there was fantastic and really taught me the ins and outs of graphic design, which then when I went back to games was like a huge help in terms of like print material, but like menus, title screens and stuff like that. And so after college, I moved to San Francisco and just did freelance artwork. And I did do some like game concept art and stuff, but it was pretty funny because a lot of the contract work I did was for mobile games. And I think I worked on like a SpongeBob SquarePants game and stuff. But you know, you just have to pay the bills at that point. Eric was drifting, doing freelance art while keeping in touch with his friends from the old click and play days. He spent his time creating art while running TigSource, one of the largest indie game communities on the internet. And in an era before the indie scene blew up, Derek wasn't hopeful about making games for a living. But then Jack Thompson got involved. Jack Thompson, for those that don't remember, was this, the notorious lawyer who was trying to take video games down for being too violent and he was associating them with all kinds of terrible things like shootings and stuff like that. It, it is kind of funny now that I think about it because in a lot of ways I have to give him some credit for getting me started because he, is, he issued this modest proposal, he called it. He kind of dared someone to make a game where you kill game developers. Right. So in his mind, game developers are making games where you kill other people and it's leading to you know mass murder and hysteria in the streets. And so, well, would you dare put yourself in a game to get killed and then see how you like it, right? I mean, it was so ridiculous. But he actually put up some kind of cash reward or something for it. Like he was gonna give $10,000 to charity if anyone did this. And I didn't have anything better to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got some of my friends on, on my own personal message board to, to help me just make that game. And so we were working on this and somehow it got out. And Alec Haloka, who I made Aquaria with, found out about the project and actually emailed me to ask if he could help with this game. And he did, he, he did I think some of the music and programming for it. Alec and I kind of exchanged ideas and he told me about some of his game ideas. We could tell right off the bat that we had a, a sort of similar drive to do this stuff. And so once this project was done, Alec and I just decided that we would work on something together. Did you get the money? I uh, know. Did he give it to charity? No, he what didn't. A, what a piece of shit. Yeah, no. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty scummy. And it was really perverse, actually. So I'm imagining, I mean, he's, he spent the time to sit, to sit there and type up just all this really perverse stuff. Like, there is a part in the game in I'm OK where you kill somebody, and then their brains come out, and then you have to pee on them. <laughs> I didn't come up with that. That was in Jack Thompson's design document and I, I like did it according to that. So, I mean, in a way I was just making this game, but he, he never ponied up. Jack Thompson didn't pay up, but Derek had struck gold regardless. He found his new creative partner in Alec Haloka. For the next two years, they would work remotely on another side-scrolling platformer, but this one would change Derek's life forever. The idea was based off of a prototype that Alec made where you're just controlling this little mermaid and she swims around this library. And I just really loved the controls, just the way it felt moving around with the mouse. And I liked the underwater theme. I love that part, but there wasn't a game there, right? Like we, we had to figure out the whole story. And at a certain point, it was a JRPG with these big bustling towns and there are all these cutscenes, And then we had to pare it down to what it ended up being, which is more of like a lonely game where it focuses more on the main character. And eventually it ended up being, I think a really good mirror into the way we felt working on the game, which was kind of lonely in a way, just separated for most of the time working on this. Aquaria was our first commercial project. It was very hard. It took us two years. We worked pretty much nonstop. And it was just a very difficult development for a lot of reasons. One, because it was our first commercial game. Two, because Alec and I didn't know each other personally like super well, so we're kind of getting to know each other and our work habits. And I think we just had different ways of doing things. 
and we had to kind of come to terms with that while we were working on this big stressful project. All that hard work paid off as Derek and Alex Game was nominated for four awards at the then fledgling Independent Games Festival. I actually remember watching this stream on GameSpot from my bedroom in Ireland back in 2007. It was a hell of a show. Andy Schatz hosted in a ridiculous three-piece suit. One winner proposed, successfully. And Cryptic Sea gave perhaps my favorite awards speech of all time. I just want to read one of my favorite passages out of the uh, Dianetics. <clears throat> Persons, as they live forward from childhood, suffer loss after loss, and each loss takes from them a little more of his quantity. Thank you. And in the audience that day, Derek and Alex sat as the first three nominations went by without a win. It was crazy how the mood just dropped at our table. I mean, I'm there with my with my now wife and my family and Alex's family and his, his girlfriend. Were your parents there as well? Yeah, my parents were there. They came out and it's just like, and so I remember looking over at Alec and I think his head was just on the table. I think my head was probably on the table too. And it was just so somber. And then they... And the IGF Seamus Manani Grand Prize winner for 2007 is Aquaria. Yeah. Yeah, this is, a, uh, this is an incredible honor. I'd like to thank my parents first and foremost because they've supported me um, my entire life. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they let me buy a lot of video games and, and that's nice. And, um, and um, oh my God, this is a terrible speech, but it's a great honor and we're happy to be here. Thank you very much. So I remember actually very clearly, I was sitting at my desk and I found out that Derek had won uh, the IGF with Aquaria. And I was still in touch with Derek and it just lit that fire in me like, oh, I, I really need to get back to games. Like, <laughs> if Derek can do it, I can do it. Like, this will be good, I'll get back to it. The expectation was that we would, after a successful release like Aquaria, that we would do another one, maybe even a sequel to Aquaria or something like that, but I just, I just couldn't do it. I really felt like I, I needed to be alone at that point, but I didn't want Alec to have to wait for me to kind of get mentally ready to work again. So yeah, we kind of went our separate ways at that point. And so I went from this big commercial game development that was really awesome in so many ways, but after that I was pining for those click and play days where in comparison it was so carefree, no pressure to make a commercial game and worry about whether people are going to like it and pay money for it. And, and so I picked up Game Maker. Yeah, it totally reminded me of Click and Play. Derek wasn't a programmer. He enjoyed game design, but building engines was beyond him. In Game Maker, he found his natural evolution from Click and Play, while working solo allowed him to move the project along at his own pace. Like most novices, he learned Game Maker by working on 2D platform tutorials. He then came up with an idea for making a roguelike, and it wasn't long until the two ideas collided. I think the first thing was just figuring out how roguelikes and platformers were gonna to fit together because they're two very different genres. And what I realized was with roguelikes, what interests me is not that they're top-down dungeon crawlers, turn-based, that, that part just really to me didn't hold the, the essence of them. To me, it was just, it was much more high concept. You know, there was the randomness, of course, but there's also the permadeath and the consequences of that. Because you know, if you die, like, that's it. And then the third thing was just that everything in, in most of the, like, canon roguelikes, everything in the game kind of shares a similar physicality, right? If there's, like, a potion on the ground, you can kick it. If there's a monster, you can kick it. You can pick up a monster's corpse. You can pick up a potion. You can throw them both. So you can like pick up a potion, throw it at a monster. You don't have to just drink the potion. So that's very novel. And I think all of those things together led to a type of game that was very emergent in design. So you get all of these kind of crazy scenarios that come up because of how everything sort of shares the same physical nature fundamentally. And you also have to think really hard about what you're gonna do. Yeah, that was really the, the essence 
of roguelikes that I liked. And I, I realized that none of that has to do with top-down dungeon crawling. Like that's all stuff that could be applied to other genres and also existed in other genres in smaller amounts. I think a friend sent me a link and said, look what Derek Yu is doing. Someone put Game Maker in Derek Yu's hands and this is what happens, essentially. <laughs> I was like, I booted Spelunky up and instantly I, it reminded me of a couple of my favorite games. It reminded me of La Milana and it reminded me of Castlevania. And I was like, okay, this is sweet. And then I died and I died like five more times and I put it down. I was like, no, I don't know about this. <laughs> Uh, and then like a month later, uh, the same friend like told me, okay, you should get a little bit more time. And I picked it up again and then it, it sunk in a little bit more and I really loved it. Yeah, I released the first version of Spelunky Classic just on a private sub forum of the TIG Source forums. It's just a place for like high level members of the forum and moderators to hang out and chat. And I released it there because I knew it would be like a small pool of you know, pretty dedicated and savvy players. And it was great, yeah, getting immediate feedback and watching people in real time explore the game and, you know, find out the kind of early secrets of the game. Seeing like the big spider for the first time or opening a treasure chest and having a bomb come out, that kind of stuff. And so it ended up being this really awesome, positive feedback loop where I really wanted to work on the game then. I just add a bunch of stuff, throw it out. They discover it, I'd add more throw it out. At the time, I kind of felt like that I might be onto something cool, and, but I wasn't sure because I had just been working on it myself for so long, and so I really wanted to have other people experience it. There's also this feeling that, you know, at some point someone might kind of figure out this mix before me and get it out you too. You have to do it now. Yeah, and so I kind of wanted to put it out and, and plant that flag in a way. After, you know, it wasn't too long after the, that first private beta version that I put out a public version. And then from there, it just kind of snowballed. So people just started talking about it on different forums. And I remember reading blog posts about uh, Spelunky, people writing really nice things about it. And then I don't think it was too long, maybe a month or two out, I got an email from Jonathan Blow, and he was having some kind of graphical glitch with freeware version of Spelunky. And so we started talking about Spelunky through that. Kind of at the end of that thread, he said, you know, I really like this game. Are you interested in putting it out on consoles? I could put you in touch with my producer. And I was like, well, you know, it was John Blow and, and he had recently put Braid out on Microsoft and it was doing really well. And so I said, yeah, sure. Especially because at the time, being on console was a big thing for indie game developers. And Braid, Castle Crashers, World of Goo, all those games came out on console and they'd all just done so well. So it felt like this is Shangri-La for, for indie game developers. And so to, to be able to get my foot in the door with John, just, yeah, it was an opportunity that I couldn't pass up. So actually, while I was talking with Microsoft and, and signing contracts and things like that, they were asking me, well, how are you gonna get this done? And I said, oh, I'm gonna find somebody. And if I don't find somebody, I'll just do the programming myself. I couldn't have done it myself, but at the time, it was so important just to get that deal going and, and make this project happen that I just said I would basically do whatever I needed to do to get it done and talk with a lot of confidence. I actually did ask John Blow if he wanted to do the programming and he declined because he was, had his own projects. And this whole time, actually, I was talking to Andy because, you know, we've been friends since the Click and Play community. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm, I've got this like Xbox version of Splunk and I'm like looking for someone to do the programming, but you know, John's busy and this other person's busy, and I think I'm just gonna end up doing the programming myself. So I kind of realized I wanted to get back to computer stuff, really, and I kind of felt like I had to leverage what I had learned at the toy company. Um, so originally, I had left and started my own company called Story Fort, and I made an interactive children's book called What is Bothering Carl? And it was about like a cyclops, and he's got a problem. I don't want to spoil it for you, like, I mean, but there's something wrong, and he's got to fix it. Um, and that actually was in the PAX 10. Um, so when I went to the PAX 10, actually, Derek was speaking uh, just in one of the panels there about TIG Source, the website that he was running. 
Um, so we, that was like the first time in a while that we'd gotten to see each other. So we met up and hung out and talked through the whole show. I mean, we had a really good time. Um, and that's when he broke the news to me, like, oh, hey, I'm, you know, I'm gonna be doing, you know, this game for Microsoft, like my Splunky. And I was like, I mean, I had known about the game, like when he was working on it. So I was like, that's awesome, right? At a certain point, Andy just asked me straight up, like, hey, you know, could I do the programming for you? And I was really surprised, I, I, because I just hadn't considered Andy for whatever reason. Um, I don't know, it's just kind of like that girl next door that, that you're like great friends with since childhood and you're like telling them about your relationship troubles and they're like, oh, you know, everything's gonna be fine and then all of a sudden it's like, wait a second, it was you all along. Part of it was wanting to work with Derek because we've been friends, I mean, years and years and we've never really collaborated. Um, so that was definitely part of it and I think the other part of it was just, um, you know, I liked the game, like I had fun with it. Um, and to be honest, like What Is Bothering Carl was not like a commercial success. To be helping Derek on something that seemed like it had like a direction and also that I felt like I really did have the skills that were required to help him, um, I just thought like this will be a fun adventure. Like, but I did not know like how kind of important Spelunky already was at that point. So I fly out and we go to the Independent Games Summit and I sit down next to Derek and like the first day of talks, and it's like talk after talk after talk. They're just using Spelunky as an example. And this is like the freeware version. And I was like, oh no. Like what have I gotten myself into? Cause like to me, I was just like, oh, we're gonna make this fun little game. Like, you know, it's not a big deal. And that was like the first moment when I realized like one, Derek was a big deal. And two, Spelunky was a big deal. And I was just, uh, yeah, from then on, it was just like, don't, don't mess this up, right? Like you've got, people are watching this actually. And with Eric, he, Eric had actually asked if he could do some music for Splunky Classic, but I already had musicians at the time. I was, I was running this net label called POS. We were putting out chiptune music, and we wanted to bridge the gap between indie games and chiptunes. Those were completely different scenes at the time, which seems really weird now, uh, but we started putting out indie game soundtracks on our label. So I emailed Eric about that so he could post those news on Take Source. Yeah. And I guess that's how we started talking. And then I said, oh, I like Spelunky, it's cool. Uh, hit me up if you need some music at some point. And then, again, when they announced they were making a remake, I was like, hey, you have anyone on board for this yet? And he said, no, and then that's how it happened. You start to build this collection of little pieces in the game. And you're putting a puzzle together in a lot of ways. So you're, you're connecting pieces and then like all these other pieces kind of sitting out and you're kind of looking at them all at once and just some stand out more than others. I mean, it can be very superficial stuff, just like it would be cool in the jungle to have a, a monkey because it's a jungle monkey. Like a lot of things can just start off that sort of simple. Like it's almost juvenile, right? Like monkeys in the jungle, but then you also have to connect it to the gameplay. Like what is, okay, how is the monkey actually gonna interact? Because if the monkey just does something that some other monster does, or it, it doesn't really fit the gameplay somehow, then there's no reason to put it in. At least for Spelunky, my aim was to have all these little pieces have a very, very simple and uh, just easy to understand personality and then have those come together and create complexity. Yeah, I was inspired by games like Pac-Man with the ghosts. So in Pac-Man, you've got the four ghosts and they have their own personalities and everyone associates, you know, the red one is, I think it's like wrath and it's very aggressive and you've got the dumb one that moves around randomly and you've got the one that like tr kind of tries to cut you off. It's, it's, the, it's the sneaky ambush ghost. So the underlying intelligence for those ghosts is very, very simple. But when they come together, it feels like this coordinated attack. And so everything in, in Spelunky was designed with a similar sensibility. We're, we're, trying to, we're trying to draw out the personality of each area, of each monster, just from very, very simple actions and things that they do. And when they all come together, yeah, you get this complexity that's very interesting and that makes every time you play, 
in this randomized environment fun, right? Because you start to see over time just all the different patterns that can arise from just having frogs that just hop around and you know the piranha just kind of swims back and forth and when you jump in the water it eats you but when you put all of those together yeah it, it, it's very interesting and you and they start to work together in different ways that's the that's the emergent gameplay that comes out of it. Spelunky is a game about mechanics interacting with one another. It's about the players coming to understand the language of this world and the emerging gameplay that comes from playing with its vocabulary. To adequately speak to the broad design philosophy of the game, we must now dive into its specifics, into the mechanics, creatures and weapons that create Spelunky. We could start anywhere on the fire frogs for instance, or the ice ray, or the damsels, but how about we start where most players do, dying over and over and over. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to consequences. Death has to be swift, and so I give the player four lives. They go so quickly. Like, the arrow in the first area takes off two. So it already just halves your life. And I remember having a conversation with Edmund McMillan. I remember him telling me, like, you gotta make the arrows just do one point of damage. It's too much. It's just too brutal, right? And I, I, I was very insistent that it takes off two. Because when things do that much damage, then you think a lot more about what you're gonna do and about not hitting them. And same with getting life back, it's gotta be very difficult to get that life back. If you're just constantly regenerating, that kinda takes away a lot of the point, right? Like I may as well just start you with 100 health. So yeah, that's where the damsel came in. I didn't want a health item that you just touched because it was too easy. It didn't fit in with Spelunky's philosophy of just being able to interact things with picking them up and yeah, like picking things up and being able to hold one thing in your hand at a time. And so having to swap between one item and another all the time, it's part of that, that uh, decision making. Like I gotta pick between this item or this item, which one am I gonna carry? You can't just hold 50 things in your backpack at once. And so the, the damsels just seem to fit really well into that. And it's a common theme in like Indiana Jones movies. Like I thought a lot about uh, Temple of Doom with Willie Scott. She's like constantly screaming and you know, you gotta like go and rescue her and things like that. And yeah, it, it also being sort of a clumsy entity, right? Like you, you know, you're talking about the bombs bouncing around and the damsels, you know, walking back and forth and running off ledges and you've got to like kind of find a safe place to put her and things like that. Yeah, this expectation that you're gonna die, um, I think it's kind of a, it can be a surprise for people. Especially for new players, people who don't play a lot of video games, I mean, the thought of dying, I guess even virtually, seems really bad. And so one of the things I wanted to do with Spelunky was to make it feel okay to die. And that's built a little bit into just the humor of the game. You die and it's it's funny when that happens, you know, it's supposed to be a little more lighthearted. I just want to make dying feel like a part of everyday life. In Spelunky, you should feel free to experiment and not feel too bad about dying. Actually, like my favorite thing in the game is the uh, freeze ray. And one of my favorite things about it is that when you freeze like an enemy and they fall into water and they're frozen, they actually float because it's like an ice cube. And that was like one of those things where like I, I was playing it and like the, where you freeze a guy and the first thing that happens is you freeze him and they fall if they're in the air, but they would fall through the water as if there was no water there and they would just shatter. And I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense. I actually had made it so that the trees in the jungle when you blew them up, like the leaves kind of float down and they land on top of the water and then they kind of like bob with the water as the water gets displaced. And so then it kind of hit me like, oh, rather than have the ice just like gently kind of fall to the bottom, like what if it like did the leaf thing? What if it kind of floated on top like it was like in a drink? Um, and that was like really cool. I was like, oh, that's great. So I was like, it's those little touches like that that I was always looking to add. It was obvious to me that like wherever we could maximize that, like we had to. And so like I always tried to code things in a way that would like allow for those interactions to happen too, right? Like if you get too specific with certain things, they're just not gonna work with other things. So it was always like, how can I do this in a way that's kind of like generic enough that maybe some other unforeseen thing could do the same thing to it, essentially. I really like the whip, which is, for some reason is also one of the first things that stood out to me. Uh, I guess it reminded me of La Milana also, but 
how you can whip behind your head and everything. Did you know about the backswing? Yeah, that, that was on purpose. I mean, the whip, the whip I wanted, I wanted it to feel very just heavy in a way. Like you throw it back, you throw it forward. I, I purposefully designed that to be fairly awkward and ungainly in a way, because, because you do go back, you go forward, but there's not like an instantaneous forward hit. I do really like boomerangs, but it just feels like the whip is the one thing I can control to some extent. One item that I really just enjoy using in the game is, is the pitcher's mitt. It's just getting to pick up something and just hurl it like straight across the screen, I really like. I really like the camera too, because it just has those like, it's that thing, it's like, oh, it kills like bats and vampires and like kind of makes sense. You're like, oh, that makes sense. And the camera also like freezes the ghost and has those special animations tied to it. Um, so that was really fun. And I remember like getting the flash working and everything so that the screen flashed and just feeling like, oh, this feels really new and neat, right? It felt like when it went in the game, there was like nothing close to this. Um, you know, and as opposed to like something like the boomerang, right? Which I, I like, it's fine, but like it didn't feel like super special when you picked it up. So it was always fun for me to do the items that were like, oh yeah, like this is gonna be, this is like something that changes how you play the game like completely. Whereas the boomerang, it's like, okay, it's a rock that comes back to you, right? Like it, essentially like that's, that's what it is, right? So um, it's less exciting to like play around with. There's like less excitement with it. Yeah, I think it, it just comes back to that sort of clumsy kind of feel that I wanted to give the player. Ultimately, what you can do is you can lay a bomb down right in front of you and then you can pick up the bomb and you can hurl it. And if you do it that way, you have a little more control over it, I feel like. And more advanced Spelunky players will use that and they'll time the bomb explosion so that you, know, you can blow up the exact spot they put on the wall. Yeah, initially it's very, it's very clumsy. And uh, for me, you know, it's all about giving the player these different layers of, of ways to interact with things and to give just the player a lot of choice about how they want to do things. Um, but it's also just about, yeah, it being okay to, to die. You know, you, you chuck a bomb, you blow yourself up. Like, it's funny, right? And, and that's fine, and you, you try again. So I do feel like eventually you can, you can get a lot of control over the bomb. But initially, yeah, it it's, can be hard. These connections just come up, right? Like, you have the sticky bombs, well, where are you gonna, get the stickiness from of paste. And what would make sense to drop paste? Well, spiders kind of, right? It's just like all these, all these fun little connections. The golden monkey pooping jewels is actually a throwback to the click and play days. That's actually a character of Andy's from click and play. So he has his Astro Spoon game that he released back then, but he also did a demo for a game called Golden Monkey Strike, where you play a gold monkey the pooping gold part was just, you know, a bit of juvenilia that, that I thought would be funny. Because we, we had to give the monkey something that it did that was helpful. So even with the Spelunky freeware version, I kind of knew that this was a little wrong in a way. It does fit in the sense that there are a lot of things in Spelunky that are wrong, right? Like just the fact that you're an explorer and you're kind of blowing up these caves that should really be in a museum. <laughs> you know, they should really be just fenced off and people are getting guided tours through them. You're just chucking bombs and destroying these priceless artifacts. If you think about it like that, and just the dark humor, you know, hitting the spikes, sliding down. So in that sense, it, it worked, right? Having a, a damsel in distress that could fall into spikes and you know, getting, getting the kiss from her at the end and, and having her be kind of throwaway. It did fit, but I also knew like that this wasn't, that kind of wrongness, I guess, it just wasn't something that I was totally satisfied with, with the, the freeware version. And I think at the very end of the Spelunky classic development, when it became 1.0, at the very end, I made it so you could play as the damsel. If you go into the changing room, which you can unlock, that's kind of like my hot fix for that, in a way. But it, it just wasn't that satisfying. Yeah, after the classic had been out for a while, a lot of the feedback about the damsel was about it being sort of sexist, right? About the damsel 
being a literal object. Right. Right. A health, a health box. You know, she could she could have just been like a a, a pot roast right. or something <laughs> like that. I, I understood the criticism for sure because I had kind of thought about it myself. And the way I am about criticism with my games is I, I take it very seriously. All kinds. If you're talking about the gameplay, the controls, you know, the, the controls don't feel right to me. I take that seriously, of course. I think most game developers would. Or I, you know, I, I just don't like this item. It's not balanced, right? And so when people come to me and they, they say, you know, the, the representation in the game is, is just not quite right. Like this, this just makes me feel a little awkward. I take that seriously too. I, I try not to take it as an affront. Like, are oh, you saying that I'm sexist? I wasn't intending, I wasn't trying to be sexist, right? I, I, no, I, I just, I take it like I take any criticism and I, I evaluate it and I feel like uh, if it makes sense, then I'll, I'll try to take strides to improve it. That's really why with Spelunky and XBLA, I didn't feel like it was right to take the damsel out. It's a remake and, you know, she was like a character in the game and I felt like to take her out, would have been to do a bit of disservice to her also. So for me, it was it was more about evening the, the play field with the hunk and then the pug. And so that, that to me felt like a way where I could do things right, but it was sort of a win-win because, you know, people could also just pick the gender of, of the person that they wanted to get kissed by too, right? So it's just, it's just much more inclusive and I, I I didn't take it as any kind of affront to me that people brought it up. I knew that the people who were criticizing the damsel in Spelunky Classic, I knew that they weren't saying that I was scum or anything like that, you know? Why the dog? Because <laughs> you could have fixed the problem by just putting the hunk in, but you put the pug in as well. Yeah, well, I felt like there maybe there are people that just, they don't want to get kissed by any person and they, they would rather just get licked by an animal. I think my favorite thing in all of, this is so sad, my wife gives that to me about this all the time. I think my favorite thing in all of Spelunky is the animation on the dog is like hilarious. Cause it's like the way his legs move and the speed he's going are not consistent. <laughs> so he just yeah. looks like this slow motion right. kind of like thing. Yeah. yeah. I'm not even sure if that's a question. I just wanted you to know that. The bats, I mean, honestly, I think when I first put them in, I probably didn't think about it too hard. They just, they sit there when you get close, they, they fly towards you. In practice, that ends up being very tricky. Just having, having something come at you from the air, you know, it's just an awkward angle because you can only attack forward and kind of like back and up a little bit with the backswing. Yeah, they just felt like they would be this very passive creature. I don't know, when I think Sasquatch, even though I made Sasquatch fight before, <laughs> to me, a Sasquatch would just be the chillest creature in the world. And the reason why you can't find them is they're just chilling in a cave somewhere in the mountains. And so I thought it would be funny if you happen to run into them, they'll, they'll chuck you, but you don't even know whether they're chucking you maliciously or if they're just trying to give you a hug and they screwed up. You know what I mean? The man trap is bright red, for one thing, which nothing else in the game, as far as I know, is like that red. I mean, there is, I guess there is that, that hawk, hawk-headed guy. But for the most part, like, you know, you get there, you're in a mostly just green and brown area, and then there's that bright red there. And then in the Xbox version, I did try to telegraph it a little more. The man trap will kind of snap its mouth open a bit. And I, I tried to aim that up so it was like, you know, don't don't jump on top of me. But yeah, I, I think it's fine that people just get eaten by it once. The game is so short that if you die, it, it doesn't feel like as much of a setback as if the game took, you know, hours to, to beat. The fire frogs I really like just because of their interaction with the water. Like, and they have this kind of like unique environmental thing uh, going on with them. Actually like the Black Knight, cause he's got that shield. And like when you first meet him, you're like, what, what is this guy? Like, what, I don't even understand, right? Like, 
there's this moment of like you have to learn about him and he's so unique that it like you like takes you back for a second and i remember like the first time i went in there i was like what is the, even his area right like you find it under a tomb and i'm like what because i had found it without derek really telling me that like he had put it in the game so i like went in there and i was like derek what is what is this place like what are you doing in here um, and there was a lot of that where I was like, Derek would like half implement something. I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. Like, can you please explain? The third area of the ice caves, it is the third area. So it comes after the jungle. And the jungle, most people feel like is the most brutal area in the game relative to when you get there. It's just this huge wall of difficulty when you first get there. I mean, by that point, people have already probably struggled through the mines and they get there and they're just kind of smashed because there's so much going on. There's just things coming at you from all sides and you've got the, the tiki traps where the spears shoot out suddenly and you know, it deals two damage to you. It's just, it's just a really tough place. So after that, I wanted to give the player a bit of a breather and introduce an area that was challenging, less so for just pure twitch, but more because it's so different. And part of the reason why I put yetis and aliens in that area is because they're sort of strange creatures. Yeah, they're kind of mythological and, and hidden in a way. So it just felt like it made sense in that area to put these sort of incongruous things because the area itself was designed to be a bit of an anomaly from the rest of the game. It's, it's a breather stage. It's the only stage it has a giant pit at the bottom. Yeah, it's almost about negative space. Yeah trying to jump over as opposed to exactly to through. instead of having that path from the entrance to the exit it's just like these islands that are floating around everywhere the one i'm like most proud of that i thought was really fun was the worm well it was like okay first like getting into the worm was like an exciting like challenge okay like how are we gonna work this like worm tongue and the worm has to come out and eat you so and then i solved that and then I was talking about the art and we're looking at it and I was like, yeah, this really needs to like move or jiggle or something, right? Like it can't just be like tiles, right? Cause it's alive, like it needs to feel like it's alive. Um, and kind of solving the challenge of like, how can I make the whole level kind of like jiggle and stuff and interact with you like while you're running around was like really fun. Um, and it was also like really brain burning cause it was like kind of a technical challenge to like animate that much on the Xbox. Like I was running into a lot of frame rate problems in the worm. Cause also it's like really tall. Like the level's huge compared to some of the other levels in the game. And so to be able to have like the interaction all the way through and like constantly animating and not slid on the game and also look good. It was like, okay, this is, that's the kind of thing I like really get into. So I was just like, I probably stayed up like one whole night just crunching on that, like getting it working. Yeah. There's still, there's still one thing. <laughs> So I had this cool idea for like, so there's the random level feelings where you like go into a level and like there's something special about like that one, right? right? So there's a lake at the bottom of the jungle um, or there's a UFO that's like inside the ice cave. And you're like, oh, this is a special event. So I wanted to do the flooded mines. So like in the first area, you would just load up like an underwater, like it would just be underwater all of a sudden. And there's like fish swimming around and you'd have to like, you know, it would use kind of the same formations, but like everything would be different because it's suddenly you can like get up to higher places really easily and things. Um, and like it's in the code, there's like, you know, code bits and fragments of the flooded mines. But it was one of those things where like Derek was never too like keen on the idea and I was kind of like just working on it in the background. Like maybe, maybe if I show him it and it's like I'm done, he'll be like awesome. And then like I ran out of time and it was kind of buggy and there were like, you know, issues that would need to be solved with it from a technical standpoint too. And it just like never materialized. And I'm always like, oh, the flooded mines. That's like the, the one that got away. The destructive terrain was actually a big part of Spelunky. It's kind of one of the key things. And it did exist uh, to a certain degree, actually quite a bit in roguelikes. Like you could break the wall with a pickaxe and net hack, for example. And yeah, that was actually a key element for, for Spelunky, was letting you destroy the terrain because one, it makes the level generation a little easier because you know you have that option of kind of blowing away your own path through the level. And so in Spelunky, the way the levels are generated, there's kind of one path from the, the entrance to the exit that you know you're gonna be able to get through without having to use bombs or anything like that. But then the rest, you know, you can have closed off rooms and it, it doesn't matter because the player can choose to use bombs to get in there. And so that was kind of the framework uh, mechanically of what I wanted Spelunky to be like. 
Part of it with that is that whole thing about everything in the game sort of sharing the same properties. So in co-op, co for example, when faced with the decision of either letting the player hurt the other player or not is so easy, right? Like, yeah, of course you're gonna be able to whip your friend or shoot your friend with a shotgun. So it just, it's like what I'm talking, was what I was talking about before. These, these decisions just make, um, they either just make completely complete sense right. right away or you just discard them. It, it's kind of like when you throw a stone or a rock and it bends off the wall and hits you back in the face and takes off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just, that's just the world you build. Totally, or it's like if a rock falls on one of those springs in the ice caves and it just bounces up and down and then you walk into it and the rock hits you and you get knocked over, that's not planned at all. That's just what emerged out of designing everything to kind of share qualities like that. We were talking about doing some kind of procedural music, right? Or have it work in some kind of systemic way, but that doesn't lend itself very well to writing melodically driven music. Really, Eric and I, as far as the overall philosophy of the music went, I think we just kind of talked about it. It wasn't me giving him direction and then him working with it too much. I think it was more just like a, a collaboration and we just had a discussion about what is Spelunky really like? And I, you know, I asked him or he just told me what Spelunky felt like to him. So I felt very strongly that Spelunky, even though the new one had HD hand-drawn graphics, still like blocky tiles and still very mechanically focused of a video game. So I felt like the music should mirror that. And then I kind of told him what Spelunky was to me. And then, yeah, he just, he just kind of went with it. I guess I felt like in the same way that the art is like hand-drawn but still looks blocky, I guess I wanted to do kind of an like an HD approach to chiptunes in a way. Same philosophy, but different execution. So in my head, I was envisioning this triangle where, where in like one end you have FM synthesis, which is like very arcade game sounding. And you had sample based tracker music, which is like very 90s PC or Amiga sounding. And then you have like live instruments, live band stuff in the third angle. And then all the music would fit somewhere in between these points with like different ratios. Yeah, it just, it just felt like a, a good fit right off the bat in that sense. Between the three of them, Derek, Andy and Eric created an evolved version of Spelunky Classic, one which still has an active community playing co-op, solo, deathmatch and logging daily challenges to this day. Much like the mines you explore, Spelunky is a bottomless pit of experiences and thus conversations, such as the power of its emergent design. It's a game that means a lot to a lot of people, but before I let the trio leave, I wanted to know one more thing. What does Spelunky mean to them? First commercial game I worked on that was released and it was a big one. It's also one of my favorite games that I've worked on just because of Andy and Derek being such good friends and good collaborators, all respecting each other's work. It's one of the most important things that ever happened in my life. I don't think there's any other way to put it. So I had gone to school for computer science and I'd done like art and I was tired of programming, but I also, when I came out, like the economy wasn't good, Try to get into the game industry, like nothing was really fitting. And a lot of the companies were like, oh, do you want to program or do art? I'm like, both, can I do both? Like, no, not really. And so like doing the toys was kind of like, oh, well, this is a cool new adventure. But in some ways it was like, oh, I'm gonna try something new because I'm not really sure the old thing's gonna work. And to realize like that it could happen and that like I did kind of get back into the industry. Um, and then just in terms of like, now I can come to GDC and people know who I am and like I, you know, will take my phone calls essentially, right? Like, I mean, my whole kind of career in video games started with Spelunky. And then also, the, yeah, the game did fantastically well. So like my personal life changed a lot because of it. And my wife was able to stay home with our daughters. And yeah, I mean, I'm just thankful that Derek, because honestly, Derek should not pick me, right? Like. He's like, he's talking to John Blow, right? Like, and choice two is like, guy who makes wooden toys. Like, that's a pretty steep drop off. Like, we went from like the pinnacle of like, one of the top programmers in the industry to like, guy off the street that hasn't programmed in five years. So like, I mean, it was like, 
it's wild to me that he decided to do that, and I'm thankful that he did. But it, I mean, it's been amazing, yeah. Well, Spelunky definitely represents just a period of my life. I think that for me, at least, I don't know if it's true of other game developers, but I, I kind of tend to think about my life in terms of games. Like, oh, this is the Aqu Aquaria point of my life. This is the Spelunky point of my life. As to what it actually represents, like what does that time to mean to me? Like I think coming more into my own in, in term, as a game developer and figuring out how it was I, I want to work exactly. I feel like I learned a lot with Aquaria and like I'm super proud of that game. But Aqu uh, Spelunky was where I feel like I hit my stride. Are you looking forward to getting back in the saddle and making more games? Yeah, yeah, I've been working on games and uh, of course, I think I'm, I'm always going to be working on games and trying to figure out how to develop games as, as a dad is, is certainly interesting. So yeah, I mean, I, it's definitely not an accident that I had my kid after Spelunky came out. The end of Spelunky marked the end of that time and the beginning of a new one, and so it, it felt like a good time to, to have a kid, and now it's a, you know, then the next period is, is starting as far as game development goes. Did you get it to Norway at any stage? Not no. yet. <laughs> I have extended several invitations to you guys. Eric, yeah, comes out here every now and then, and it, obviously it's always a real treat to have him since he's so far away. But For me, it was pretty life-changing, actually, coming out of here for the first time, having been in my own basement in Norway working on games uh, for a number of years already, and mm. no one having any idea of what I was doing down there. Right. And suddenly I come out here and everyone has a pretty, everyone's heard of the stuff that I'm working on, like Spelunky. And when I came back from like my first trip over here is when I fully realized that I need to quit my day job and do this like for a living. It feels really good to do it all together. And yeah, yeah because I think we all were in, in different places in our lives, yeah. but it, yeah, it also was this big change for all of us too at the same time. And I think we don't, you don't really realize like what was going on until it's over, right? Like when you're going through it, it just feels like, oh, this is like normal. It's like, I'm doing exciting stuff, but it feels like not life changing. It just feels like things are just happening. Um, and it's like at times like this, when you meet up and talk about like what happened and how crazy that was, that it really like comes back to you, like how big of a change it really was and how unique that opportunity was, right? Like I feel um, so lucky, but at the time I just felt, you know, like that that kind of thing just happens, right? And what are you guys doing tonight when, when we turn off the camera? We're talking about doing some karaoke. I'm, I'm definitely being down for some karaoke. I would really like karaoke. Mini golf came up. Some dinner. Definitely this, dinner though first. Yeah, dinner dinner first always, but we'll yeah. see. Yeah, it's- you Gotta feed, feed the handy. <laughs> You know, the guy I met it from Click and Play and then this Norwegian guide, so who knows like what's gonna happen tonight. <laughs> <laughs>